The following podcast is sponsored by Structure Tech. You have to find that scapegoat to maintain your mental sanity, especially when it's you know below zero outside. Yeah, you need something to look forward to. Yep. For Tessa, that's building science, just so everybody knows. She, she goes <laughs> and solves building science mysteries for people. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich, alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. As always, your three-legged stool coming to you from the Northland, talking all things houses, home inspections, and anything else that's rattling around in our head. Well, welcome to the new year. I guess this thing will pop long after the new year, but it's kind of our new year launch. So, Tessa, Ruben, how's it going? Never better. I'm I'm sure it could use a little bit more snow. That would be (laughs) just fine with me. Otherwise, it's uh, it's winter in Minnesota. Have you been able to get out and and go snowmobiling yet? No, not really. There was one day, like last week, maybe my son, Cy, and I went out because he just got his license and we we went out one night and I let him drive. I didn't drive it a bit because it was kind of his first time driving. He's 14. And Mm -hmm. we went out for a little while, but the snow was so thin. It's like, I mean, and he's not going to get any speeding tickets. (laughs) I'll put it So he doesn't drive like you? (laughs) No, not at all. Wait a minute. We haven't introduced our guest. Well, yeah, we should probably do that because it's it's important. Uh, Kyle's giving us his valuable time today. So let's get him some airtime right away. And then you can go back and amusing about your snowmobile. Well, I got to ask Kyle about snowmobiles too, because we got that in common. All right. Well, let, let, let's let's just start this uh, the way we should have started it, and then we'll get back to that. So on today's episode, we are very happy to have Kyle Miller from All Around on, and I'm ready to pick Kyle's brain because I have some shingle questions. And, and Kyle, I'll, I'll let you jump in and tell everybody who you are. At All Around, you guys are exterior specialists, correct? Yeah, Bill, Ruben, and Tessa, my friends at Structure Tech. It's a pleasure to finally be on Structure Talk. Ruben's been talking about it for a while. He's invited me like 27 times every time I said yes. And then uh, finally was able to, you know, muster up the courage to say, when's the next date? Ruben and I have actually been on our radio show plenty of times together. So we're no stranger to this shooting the stuff together type format, talking construction and home inspections, just another walk in the park for us. Bill, I'm, I'm sure I can answer your questions, but hopefully you have a couple of brain busters. For those listening, All Around is an exterior general contractor. We're located right in the Twin Cities. If you're familiar with the West Metro, we're right on Wyzetta Boulevard in Long Lake. So if you're ever in downtown Long Lake, you will see we're right across from Ottenbro's Nursery, a big gray and blue building. We've been in business for about 13 years in our special our core services are roofing, siding, windows, and decks. And if you want to learn more about us, you can feel free to just look up All Around Construction on Google. You can go to Facebook and look up All Around, or you can also find our website at allaround.com. Okay, so I wanted to talk shingles because I have a problem. You do have to pause before we get to shingles, though. Ruben had a snowmobiling question. Oh, and Ruben, okay. I'll let you guys finish that up. Yeah, I've been, I've been out a couple times right after that. We got like seven or eight inches up in my house in Elk River. And then, so just a short trail ride. And then my kids also have, I got four and a five-year-old boys. We have two little 120 sleds and we go out on the lake and they'll either ride their sleds or I'll pull them on a snow tube out there. So we, we've gotten to rip around a little bit, but it, it sucks, man. Like the winters seem to, we get snow, it melts a little. It's not consistent. Yeah, it's like living in Des Moines. <laughs> so was that was that your yeah, question, that's, Ruben? Like, that's sad. Yeah, I wanted to know if you've gotten out, of it, out at all. You have. That's good. There, yeah, but barely. Okay, all right. So, but you got to have winter hobbies. You got to have some sort of fun to be had in Minnesota in the winter. Otherwise, it gets too long and miserable, you know, whether... It's something indoors, that's fine too, but you have to find that scapegoat to maintain your mental sanity, especially when it's you know below zero outside. Yeah, you need something to look forward to. Yep. For Tessa, that's building science, just so everybody knows. She, she goes <laughs> and solves building science mysteries for people. I could talk for hours about this new show I've 
been binging, but that will be for another podcast. Hold on. <laughs> Wait, just, all right. Well, you can't do that. Yeah. What show? It's a BBC show. It's called Restoration Home. And it's basically these old, uh, these historic buildings in England and Scotland and Great Britain that basically get bought up by just regular people that want to fix them up, but they're dilapidated and they're protected by the government because they're historic. And so they have to basically like there's these very strict guidelines that are in place for how you can remodel them and fix them up. But it's fascinating to see these houses that are like 500, 600 years old that just have generation after generation of, you know, of layers of history to them. And just to see the materials that they use and how they've withstood the test of time and how things that we've done in the last hundred years have ruined them. <laughs> they were fine before we started, you know, putting on materials that didn't breathe and, and allow drying and stuff like that. So I totally been obsessed with that show recently. Five or 600 years old. That's, that's crazy. We've done uh, yeah. some historic homes in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And granted, we don't touch the inside of a home really, unless we're trimming out windows and, and very little, but the architectural standards, keeping the original aesthetics of the home, those are strict requirements. And I can't imagine doing it on something that's five or 600 years old And the, the craftsmanship, the skill that's needed, I can yeah. imagine is the greatest challenge is to find the people who can actually put the tools in the hands and, and make that stuff happen. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. They show a lot of skilled craftsmen, you know, with stone and wood and plaster and everything. It's, you know, dying trades, but it's really, really fascinating. What's that called again? Yeah, name of the show. It's called Restoration Home. I found it on Amazon Prime. So, you you know, I think there's three seasons of it, but it also dives into just the history of the, of the time period too. So you learn a little bit about what was going on in the culture and the people that lived in the house and the way of life back then and the actual like building structure itself. Yeah. Let me guess they do it with this because it, oh, it's not on HGTV. Never mind. If it was, then it'd be like, <laughs> We do this on a twenty thousand dollar budget. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. I yeah, I gave up on HGTV a while ago. <laughs> in two weeks. Yeah. We, we sense no cynicism in that. <laughs> I love HGTV. Just some of the information may not be incredibly accurate. Yeah, and actually, you know, spoiler alert: there are some episodes where they don't finish the renovation. And the first time I saw it, I was like, what? You know, it's so unsatisfying because you get pulled into it and you, you know, you're dedicated to it. So it's definitely not like HGTV. There are not always happy endings in that show. <laughs> this wow. is a lot more reality. It is. Oh, yes, okay. for sure. Uh-huh. Huh. Yep. All right. We're going to jerk back into the lane that we started driving in. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're going to get the shingles? Yes. Let's get right. the shingles. Okay. <laughs> Fine. So let me, let me set that. this up. I, I've got a problem. I, I look at roofs. I don't know why, but my attention's always drawn to roofs. When I'm driving, when I'm walking, my wife is always like eyes on the road, eyes on the road. And, but one thing I've noticed, there's a neighbor down the street from me. They did a re-roof probably 10 years ago at the same time that they built a garage. The shingles are all beginning to slide off of the roof. And I mean, this is maybe 10, 15 shingles that I've noticed, but I've been watching it over the last 18 months. And I'm just thinking like, who's responsible for this? And who's the forensics person that comes out and determines, is this a materials problem? Is this an installation problem? Is it a combination of both? And this happened from a previous homeowner. The people who owned it did the construction and then they moved. They're, they're gone. And I tried to look up the contractor on the permit through the city and I can't get anywhere. You know, I can't find any names there. So how does a homeowner who's, they just come in, they buy this house and, hey, we, we redid the roof 10 years ago. Should be good for another 20. Like, how do they fix this? And is there any recourse in these situations? So I'll start with being blunt, Bill. And say that their only option might be to just pay the money to have it done right, especially after this amount of time being the second owner. And unfortunately, this is a problem that happens often, whether it's the contractor going out of business, whether the home transfers ownership, I put equal amount of fault on the homeowner who hired the contractor to begin with, because we see it all the time. They take the cheap bid. They put too much trust in the contractor in the process and they fail to you know, do proper due diligence and they end up getting something subpar. 
Now, shingles sliding off the roof, to me, that screams uh, an installation error that the shingles were high nailed. Uh, you know, the, every shingle has a nailing strip, an optimal zone where the manufacturer wants those nails placed, optimally six nails in that nailing zone. Four is adequate for, for most manufacturers, but optimal is six in that nailing zone. And this is actually one of the most common problems we see with the installation is that the nails are either put too high, they miss that nailing zone, or they're overdriven. So when that roof is being installed, they got two, three, four nail guns hooked up to a big air compressor, and that air compressor has to be dialed in to the correct PSI in order to drive those nails flush. And oftentimes the nails are overdriven. You know, they'll blow right through that shingle if it's 10 PSI too high and just rendering them useless. That's likely what's going on. And the most common problem we see as to why shingles will just slide off of a roof like that. Um, you know, in some cases, you get a good shingle that was installed at, at a good temperature and they'll seal down really, really good. The problem kind of conceals itself. Doesn't mean it's not there, but it might hold the shingle up there better. But I would say this second owner probably has no recourse, especially if that contractor is no longer a business, especially if they're outside of you know a 10-year structural warranty period. And even if they were within that, for them to try to hire legal help to pursue something against the builder would probably not be worth it, You know, where they could just pay maybe a few thousand dollars out of pocket to get the problem fixed. It would not be worth pursuing, in my opinion, at least not in this circumstance where a bigger problem might if that builder or contractor was still in business. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I hear what you're saying, it's it's almost always installation error. And almost always, yeah. Common common shingle defects you see. Well, you do have seal failures, you know, where sometimes wind will go and blow shingles off. That's kind of where they, but wind was going to peel that shingle off upwards off the roof. You know, a wind that's high enough to peel shingles off of a roof, they're definitely not going to be sliding down the slope. They're going to be like peeled backwards and maybe nowhere to be found. Or maybe the wind breaks them free enough and then they start to slide off the roof. What you're going to see most of the time is an installation error. If there's a seal failure, which is not common, but it can happen. Sometimes, you know, those shingles aren't locked together and they might come off the roof easier. But other manufacturer defects might include like pitting of the shingles, excess granule loss, Sometimes the colors get really, really goofy, which you'll typically notice right after the installation. But I would say just in my seven years experience, over 90%, 95% or more of the roofing issues that we see when we get contacted based on someone having a concern, not just ready to replace their old roof, but hey, I have a problem here. How can we fix it? It's due to an installation, not a manufacturer defect. Gotcha. Now, Ruben, I remember early in my structure tech days, you were up on a, a rebuild house in Edina or Minneapolis, I don't know, southwestern part of town. And there was a horrible roofing situation where the nails were underdriven, actually. They, they were sitting up an eighth of an inch. And you know, I remember because we went back to that house for a reinspection that after the contractor supposedly tried to rectify it. it do you remember that rough? I think I remember that one. And that was a rebuild. And I, uh, I've i got pictures of it. I could pull up those pictures pretty quickly. They're included in a blog post I published. I wrote it many years ago, but I redid it last year. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. The title of it was Improper Shingle Nailing. And yeah, there was nails that were underdriven all over the roof. And if you stood at the right place on the ground and you looked up, so your line of sight was pretty much right in line with the, the roof slope, you could see all these underdriven nails from the ground. Ruben, how old was that roof? Brand new. Brand, it was brand new. Thinking. Okay. Because there is a phenomenon where you see in older roofs, the nail pops, uh, not on yep. the inside, uh, you know, above the, on the exterior side where you'll start to see shingles lifted. And Tessa, this would be a cool building science topic to study, but what is the actual scientific reason why nails will defy gravity and wiggle their way up and out of a shingle over time. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I see it, you know, quite often you'll see a little shingle kind of scalloped on the roof and it's like, Oh, it's this old rusty nail kind of working its way out. I, I can tell you what happens a lot is, and you're going to love this one, Kyle, you get storm chasers. You get people coming into Minnesota who are not from around here. At least that's my assumption. They're from uh, Edina. 
<laughs> in Dina, <laughs> yes. They, uh, they're used to working in more Southern climates where it's acceptable. They, they have thinner roof sheathing there. We've got thicker roof sheathing because we've got the snow load we got to deal with. But you go down south, they don't have snow loads to deal with. They have thinner roof sheathing. And because of that, they can actually use shorter nails. They can use three quarter inch roofing nails in those southern climates. So you get people who are used to that. They come up here, they use three quarter inch nails on the old roof boards where we've got, you know, not sheathing, not four by eight sheets of plywood, but you'll ha actually have boards for the roof sheathing. And that stuff is a lot thicker. And you put the traditional nail in there where the point of the nail doesn't actually poke through to the other side of the wood. And over time, that wood expanding and contracting over and over again will push on the point of the nail and wedge the nail back out with that freeze-thaw cycle. And that's why in Minnesota, the minimum roofing nail needs to be, or you know what, I said three-quarter inch. I meant to say one inch. The minimum nail in Minnesota is one and a quarter inch. Yeah, and you actually need less than a quarter inch gap if you're going to have plank sheathing, depending on the shingle manufacturer, you know, a quarter to an eighth inch gap or less in between those plank boards. And a lot of times you see one by sixes, one by eights. I actually like that type of sheathing. We do because compared to your, your strand board, your oriented mm -hmm. strand board structurally, it's solid. You know, I like when I see yeah. a nice one by eight yeah. tightly sheathed roof deck, you know, homes aren't built like there used to be, but, and I, I didn't know that Ruben and I appreciate you sharing now driving around just like Bill. When I see those <laughs> roofs, I'm going to now know why those nails yeah. are wiggling their ways out unless it is on a, on a newer home. Then yeah, I'll of course be it does in my head. It doesn't explain all of them. The only way you're going to know for certain that that's the problem is you go to one of those nails and grab it and pull it out. And if you got a one inch nail, well, there's your problem. Yeah. So to answer Bill's or put in full circle, his original question, the new owner of that home bill, he should call, he or she should call a roofing company, have them out to inspect it. More than likely, they're going to need a quote to repair it. You know, just do the bare minimum for now to, to get that roof um, fully covered and and shedding water and debris like it should be. Make sure they have proper insurance coverage because maybe, you know, they'll get lucky and get a hailstorm, get to hire someone and and get a new roof on there at the cost of their deductible. Other than that, there's really probably not much they can do. Okay, a couple follow-up questions. Warranties don't sound like they're transferable, or are they? It depends. Now, that responsibility, the original warranty, you have two options, or three, I should say, if you do nothing after the job is done. But let's say you have a contract and it's, you know, it's Owens Corning or GAF, you know, you would get a standard product warranty if you suspected there is a material defect. Let's just say the shingles are very blistery or just losing tons of granule for really no reason after a couple of years. You could contact the manufacturer's warranty department directly, typically within a 10-year period, depending on the manufacturer and the warranty. There's some proration there, but if they identify there's a problem, you have to send in a shingle, they'll, you know, which has to be done by a contractor or the homeowner, but the manufacturer is not going to come out and pull a shingle off your roof for you that burden is on the homeowner and they identify that there is a defect, chances are you'll be reimbursed the material to fix the problem and have to pay for the labor. And if you hired a contractor who registered an extended warranty for you, then that manufacturer, if they discovered there was a legitimate defect, they would pay for all the costs, the tear off, the disposal, the labor and material to make the problem right. And if that Extended warranty is registered. Let's say it's a system protection with OC or a systems plus with GAF. Those are their certifiable warranties that contractors around town can install. They have upper tier ones too that actually cover workmanship, but those are transferable to a second owner. But that responsibility is of the second owner. So the second owner has to contact the manufacturer. I think with, with Owens Corning, they pay $100 and that warranty coverage will transfer into the second owner. So like if we're doing a roof bill and we register a system protection warranty with Owens Corning, part of that, that sales process and explaining the warranty to the customer, they're going to know and understand that it's transferable. And sometimes it's very marketable for people who are selling their house in the next few years is that they have an extended transferable warranty, but that would fall on the new owner to, to have it transferred into their name. Let's just be honest here. I mean, 
What percentage of the time do you think the new owner registers that warranty? I have no idea. Probably very few. Yeah. I got to think like 1%, maybe less. Well, yeah, it seems like a communication, like a breakdown in communication, because if you, if you actually paid for the extended warranty and you did Kyle, like you said, turn around and use that as a marketing tool, then someone should follow through and just make sure the second owner makes the call to get the value of that extended warranty. So it just feels like it, it requires a certain amount of follow through that if you don't know the process, you don't know you have to take that step, which is these are some of the, the, the little details that I, I love to uncover because I, I did want to ask, is it similar with like siding or windows or anything else that you, you guys install? It, it depends on the product. And I am not. I'm not, uh, let's say, very well spoken on every, you know every detail of warranties and their terms and conditions of all the products. But in general, most of them are transferable to a second owner. Some of them require action. Some of them do not. So you'd have to go in and look at the specific warranties. And people who are very savvy consumers, they, you know, especially in the digital era that we live in, they look into that stuff. They do their own fact checking. I, I love that because, you know, contractors who are out there trying to be a little bit snaky or misleading in their sales, they can be put in check by savvy homeowners who, who do their own homework. And, and all that information is readily available online. People can go and read the warranty documents and ask questions before they pay a ton of money for this product and service. I, I did want to ask, it, it, it sounds like you've got the most space or you can turn a roof around more quickly than anything. I know, Ruben, when we've been out inspecting and you find some some problems with the roof and the word repair with roofs doesn't always really seem to align with the way a lot of companies want to do business. They either want to like replace the roof or, or not touch it. Uh, how do you guys feel about repairing roofs? So there's a degree of liability when you pull out a hammer and nails on any job. And we certainly don't walk away from repairs. We just, we price them appropriately. We repair a lot of roofs, probably 80 to hundred a year. And if it's something that's a bigger liability, then, then it's priced accordingly. If it's something that's non-repairable, you know, as those building materials get super old and brittle, we have to make a subjective decision. And ultimately, it's up to the to the homeowner if they want to hire us and take our advice. But there are some jobs we won't touch unless we're we're doing the entire thing. And that's because we don't think we can dig into it and give them a you know roof with integrity or a repair with integrity without screwing more stuff up. So there's always that approach as well, where you have to determine, is this repairable? And what sort of liability are we taking on? I'm familiar with the hunger that other roofing contractors have to just do full roofs. And especially when it comes to storms, you know, they want to get in and out, make the quick money. They just want the roofs, yada, yada, yada. We could go on for days about that. Most of the good companies, they'll, they'll do repairs, but you have to first make sure that you can do the repair and do it right by the homeowner and not be taking on some huge liability that, uh, that it's going to fail or cause more problems than, than what you're repairing. Well, thank you for kind of clarifying that. One last question or kind of begin to wrap this up. Ruben, I know you, when you see hail damage, you're never really too bent out of shape about it. Like there isn't some massive urgency to get this roof replaced in the next week or two. If, if a shingle's got, it's got damage, but it's not significant. Like what's your level of urgency to get on that roof and try to get those shingles off and get it replaced? I mean, say you, you in, a, in this environment, it's obviously crazy. I think you understand where I'm going with this question. Do people really have to be freaking out that, oh, the storm was last week and now I need this done in the next six weeks? No. Hail damage typically will take life off of the back end of the shingle. There are extremes. I've seen pictures, haven't experienced it here, but in, in Texas, Oklahoma, where the hail will actually go through the roof, you know, through the drywall, start dinging up appliances. Obviously, we're not talking about that. I'm talking about your average Minnesota hail event where you get nickel, quarter size, sometimes even golf ball or ping pong ball or tennis ball size hail. And um, it does some damage. The density and the velocity is actually much more important than the size of the hail. And when it comes to 
the how much damage it can do but on average you know you get your quarter size hail and it's pretty dense and it's doing some damage it's dinging up metals it's it's scratching paint it's banging up the cars on the roof specifically it's going to bruise the shingle so you're gonna have granule loss and then and then if it's legitimate by hag standards or what a lot of insurance companies want to see it's actually going to break the matting of the shingle i don't want to say that there is zero urgency but it's not the fire drill there is adequate time for the homeowner to do their due diligence and follow the process the right way. So that might mean if you don't have somebody you trust, you can get two or maybe even three opinions. You can ask for pictures, ask for somebody to explain, you know, do your, do your homework as if you were consuming um, a tens of thousands of dollar uh, product or service, because that's what it's going to end up being once the insurance company pays for it. And another thing you don't want to do is is nothing. So if there's a hail event, like a lot of people, they'll they'll do nothing. And then all of a sudden, two years goes by and they, can, they can't do anything anymore. The contractor will come out to inspect and the homeowner, maybe they have legitimate damage, but the homeowner just decides to do nothing because they're uncertain or fearful to make an insurance claim where that's what the insurance coverage is there for. So there's a lot of different variables that go into it, but the fire drill thing is something that storm chasers are very good at. They're good at creating sense of urgency, uh, telling people that their roof is is subject to leaking and mold. And, you know, you got a sign here on the, on the dotted line. You know, there's a lot of shady stuff going on. Not to discredit the good companies in town, because a lot of the people knocking doors are doing good, honest business. You know, for the listeners that can really just keep this one piece of advice in mind, unless there's holes in your roof, there the fire drill thing is just a just a smoke screen to get you to do something fast and not make what should be a, a wise and calculated decision on who to hire and what process to follow. Awesome. Okay, last question, and we're going to go back to warranties real quick. You said the contractor is actually the person who's kind of like instigate. They're they're starting that process of the warranty. Do you have to provide pictures of the work you've done, the various steps, so the uh, the manufacturer knows what or has visually can see how you guys installed? In, in short, no, Bill. That's a great question, and I'm happy to offer further clarification on this. So. It's usually the homeowner's responsibility to register product warranties, just like with anything else that you buy. But with roofing specifically, you have certifications and the roofing manufacturers will certify a contractor based on the volume of work they do. And once you get to a GAF certified, whether master certified installer or an Owens Corning certified, we're a platinum preferred contract with Owens Corning or GAF has master elite. So once you get to tier one or tier two of these certifications, the manufacturer lets the installer, the roofing installer, the roofing contractor register an extended warranty. And we also are required to use their roof accessories. So we have to put on Owens Corning ice and water, Owens Corning synthetic felt, their shingles, their ridge cap, depending on what warranty registering, sometimes even their starter or their ventilation products. If we're installing a platinum warranty, we have to use five of their accessories. So including the shingle, we take on the burden, not really a burden. It's just part of our process. So we take on that for the customer. We're going to go into the system with Owens Corning, register that warranty in the homeowner's name. So the warrant, the, the homeowner retains the warranty. It's in their name. We just do it for them. And, um, and a lot of contractors don't do this. <clears throat> and should the roof have a defect just by default, because we were the ones doing the work, the homeowner is going to contact us, but that product and buyer relationship is between the homeowner and the manufacturer. We are the installer and we like to, will happily be the liaison and the dot connector. Now, if we did everything the right way, and there's a perceived defect in the manufacturer decides, you know, they're not going to cover it. There's nothing we can do as a contractor. We did our job correctly. And that's why we like to partner with good manufacturers that stand by their products. But with roofing, it's, it's always good to have a contractor that's certified because there's a lot of them in town, probably over a hundred between GAF and OC, probably like 200 if you add certainty and both tiers of certifications and, um, and make sure that you're asking the questions. And it really doesn't cost us much to register a system warranty for the homeowner. And it's just going to alleviate a lot of hoops that they might have to jump through should they have 
a defect. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Because, yeah, I mean, it's everybody always says it's the devil's in the details. And, and you when you go stand at the, the lumber yard or the big box store and you're looking at shingles and you're like, can you see a 30 year warranty? Well, I always wonder, what does that mean? Or a lifetime warranty? Is it really 30? Is it really a lifetime? Usually when you get to year 30, the warranty is like zero. You know what I mean? Where with a system protection warranty, and I, I had, let me, let me explain this too, because I don't want to be gimmicky. And I see through some of the devil in the details stuff where when we, when we register an extended non-prorated warranty on year 30, that customer still has hundred percent coverage for labor material if there was a defect, but there's some caveats to that. So if the whole, if the, the warranty is transferred to a second owner and that second owner didn't, didn't register it in their name, it drops off, begins prorating. And there are also a lot, you know, some other fine print. If, if so, if the home sells twice, which on, on average within ten years it'll sell at least once, maybe twice, the manufacturer might make a, a subjective decision. But if you look at any roofing warranty, it's going to talk about being properly ventilated because that affects the life and performance of the shingles, and uh, and it has to be properly installed too. So that can affect whether or not the manufacturer is going to actually live up to paying their share of the issue because they might have a leg to stand on if, if the install was, uh, was done poorly. So there's all these little things that could go into it, but 50 year warranty on a shingle, although most of your major manufacturers have moved to that on a laminated shingle, it's not realistic to think that a, a JF Timberline or no one's corning duration or a, you know, a certainty is going to last 50 years, they're kind of playing the numbers game, you know, and, and using yeah. that for the marketability. And realistically, you can get 25, I'd say useful years out of a new laminated shingle, but I wouldn't expect any more than that. See, that's good information because that's what people, you know, we get asked those questions all the time. Love it. Thank you, Kyle. This has been good. I, I, I got to stretch a little more than I thought I was going to in this conversation. So awesome. Thank you, Kyle, so much for your time. I appreciate it. Can you, again, can you tell everybody where to get a hold of you guys? Yeah, absolutely. I would just hop on Google, type in all around or all around construction, and you'll see our, our Google page pop up. We have over five, 500 reviews. If you land on some other weird page, it's probably not us. Or you can go to our website, allaround.com. You could call us if you're old school like that. You want to hop on the, the, the old, what do they call those things where you do a little finger circle on the phone? <laughs> 763-447-3944. Find us on social media. Looks like Tessa had a question in closing as well. Well, I did, but it, it's not related to um, warranties or shingles or anything like that. But I was just curious, you know, your company does a lot of like siding and roof, you know, replacements and, and deck work. Do you guys come across like hidden, unknown, surprise, like water intrusion damage a lot? And if so, would you say that you come across it most commonly because it's due to like installation, uh, improper installation, or is it a material defect or is it like due to design? Just curious, like what you guys have come across with all your experience. I love this subject and it's a great question. <laughs> Tessa, we, we don't commonly come across big surprises. As you know, being in the home inspection business, when you look over things thoroughly, even though you don't have laser vision inside the wall, we don't probe the wall like you guys will with a moisture meter, but there are indicators that there may be some water damage behind the walls. With roofing, you can typically get a view into the attic, you know, and roofs are made to shed water. So it's not as common to see like large scale issues when you tear off a roof and you combine that with being able to look in the attic and you can determine if there's going to be some sheathing replacement with that. We, most commonly we uncover, I guess, with air quotes, surprises with siding, because you just don't know how expansive it is sometimes mm -hmm. around your windows because the drip cap was flashed or something like that, or there was no drip cap or nail fin wasn't put on quite right over, maybe over the building wrap. And you get like some rot around the corners and maybe you got a couple hundred bucks for the sheeting replacement. If you have like an older house and it's all wood-based products like cedar siding, wood brick mold on the windows, wood soffit fascia, it's pretty easy to do the discovery because there's going to be something that you're going to see. The water is not going to rot the inside of the wall without there being something rotted on the outside of the wall. Like you're just going to see something, you know what I mean? Ruben, you can back me up on this. Like you're not going to have a, some perfect cedar facade, wood facade on the outside and the inside completely rotted. Maybe it's happened before, but 
you know, typically you're going to see that rotted wood on the outside, poke your finger through it or whatever. And then you're like, mm-hmm. you know, that on the inside, there's going to be something. And most of the time, Tessa, it's a, uh, it's installation. You guys know with stucco for a period there in the, in the nineties and maybe early two thousands, like they built the homes too watertight. They like trapped the moisture in. And we actually had a home where we did stucco tear off. It was a hundred thousand dollars in framing change orders, framing, insulation, rim joists, wall sheathing, like the works, thankfully, you know, the people could pay for it because by golly, it was, it was huge. And then what, what I really cannot stand is some of the design of these new houses, the architects, the designers, they make them so big and beautiful. And I swear to the very last thing on their minds is water management. You have these massive roofs, like three roof slopes going down into this tiny valley with a one foot eave right over the, in the middle of the, of the driveway or right over the front door. You know what I mean? I'm like, why on earth wasn't this something that was thought about? And the people like, Oh, can you put a gutter here? Sure. But it's not going to stop the problem. You know, the design as a two part aspect, one, the design as in how it's built, like the stucco, the, the science of it, how the materials are applied. And then two being you know, where do those angles and slopes and everything come together, which is going to determine where the water goes. And, uh, and, and ultimately if, if the building materials can handle that volume of water coming at it in those areas. There you go. There you go. Ruben, I know you're, I see you shaking your head or like nodding up and down. That's, that's water yes. intrusion, yes. gabelitis, all those bad things that architects do. And we love them because visually the houses should look pretty too, but sometimes functionally they don't. You can do both. You know what I mean? Like it's possible. What I don't like is, is the valley terminating into a wall or the chimney in a valley. Oh yeah. my <laughs> goodness. Worst. Yes. The dreaded chimney in a valley. All right. I'm going to leave everybody with that visual in their head. Like what could possibly go wrong? Thank you, Kyle. We appreciate your time today. It's, it's awesome to get to see it from the other side, you know, as a, as a person who it hopefully never has to navigate a warranty. At least I have a little understanding of what that process all looks like. So thank you again. Again, that was Kyle Miller from all around. Ruben, Tessa, good to see you again. Everybody, you've been listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Bill Ulrich alongside Tessa Murray and Ruben Saltzman. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, contact us at StructureTech.com.